Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below. Uh, thank you all for showing up. I am looking forward to the discussion. And I have a rather long and raggedy presentation. But the main argument I want to make, I think, will be clear enough, which is that we need to start looking at this coinage, which is known as Arab Sasanian, although I prefer to think of it as the coinage of Iran under its early Muslim governors from 651 to 705. And during this period, as I think you all know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time expl explaining the elementary stuff. Uh, the uh, Muslims uh, issued coins from various mints that had the same types, that is images and inscriptions as the earlier coinage of the Sasanian Empire but with this addition of a short or sometimes later on longer Arabic inscription to indicate that it was being issued by an Islamic state or Islamic government. All right, uh, this is the book that more or less established the parameters of this field of study, printed in the same year that I was printed actually. Um, I don't know who was first. Walker's catalog in 1941 uh, listed the coins essentially by person who named on the coin in no particular order that I can figure out, or at least it's hard to understand what the order is. The anonymous coins come first, then come the coins by mint alphabetically, and the problem with alphabetically, of course, is another thing. They, we, of course, the alphabet of the coins is not our alphabet. It has to be transcribed. So alphabetically depends on which transcription you use. And then under each mint by date. Person then are the divisions of the catalog. Mint under the person and then date. That is not, in my opinion, a historical grouping. Uh, the order that he chose is pretty arbitrary. And in any case, the persons don't necessarily pull together uh, the, the, uh, the story of the coinage or rather the stories. What I have done is to divide this, the sequence of this coinage, the chronological sequence into 12 episodes, I've called them, or phases. In those episodes, then there may be subphases because the coinage was not always uniform at any given time. This red line is deliberately crude. Uh, it defines Iran Shar. It defines more or less the original territories of the empire. Note that it is Iran. You can see the Caspian Sea at the top and the Gulf at the bottom. It also includes Iraq, uh, particularly the ir irrigated uh, lowlands of Iraq, where the, in fact, the capital of the, of the empire was. Um, but of course, the boundaries, this was not the modern times. We do not have lines in the sign with crossing gates across the roads. Um, and it was known to the Arabs, all of this territory as Al-Mashrik, the east. The east went on and on and on. Theoretically, they could go as far as the Pacific Ocean, but they never got that way. They never got that far. So I've not included coins of this series or labeled with this label, Arab Sasanian, that come from outside this area. What this is, is what one might call the mainstream, the Iranian coinage. Uh, I don't know what just happened. Uh, it, it, is, it, it is focuses on the coinage of the land of Iran itself with, of course, including Iraq. Clearing the underbrush is the secret to success in this kind of study. One has to clear out a massive underbrush. 
there's the misleading data created by previous students, previous scholars, by their misreadings and other mistakes, including me, we've all made them. Secondly, the corpus is full of coins that look like they might be Arab issues, but their actual uh, uh, origin is not at all clear. There are lots and lots, in other words, of imitations. There were huge tracts of this mountainous desert territory that were outside the control of central authorities where people could set up a mint, particularly perhaps at a place where a mine was producing silver and make coins and they would make coins that looked like ordinary coins, but they were not necessarily. The, we, the, the definition for me of a funny looking coin, which I think is a great term, uh, term is that the mint on it is false and the date on it is false. In fact, either one of them could be false and the other true. That kind of stuff has to be weeded out. I will not talk about it. I would like at some point to discuss some of the major series of imitations that we have that seem to be coming from one single source with a characteristic inscription, for example, Lila to God for God in the margin of the coin. There's a whole group like that with various mints, various dates. They were probably minted all in one place. We don't know where it is, of course, and perhaps in a short period of time. So then we start dividing the coinage into phases, but wait, I haven't got there yet. We have here a chart that I think is extremely useful and important as a way to look at the government's plural of Islam in this period, in this half century. We think of it as being one caliphate after another, all very orderly. Uh, Muawiyah came after Uthman. Then uh, after him came Ziyad. After him came, bump, 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 a cousin of theirs, Marwan. The Umayyad Caliphate, preceded by the Rashidun Caliphate. All these labels, all these groupings are modern artificial structures. And what I've tried to do in the chart you see here, caliphs and governors named in Al Mashrik, or Iran Shar, are actual persons ruling a territory uh, with dates. And I've labeled the caliphates not by the family but by the place where they had their capital, which seems to make good sense. So that you had simultaneously the Kufa Caliphate with Ali and in Damascus, Muawiyah, both of them claiming to be Caliph, both of them recognized by their uh, followers as the legitimate Caliph. There can only be one legitimate Caliph, but who, which one it is, is, uh, I'm sorry to say, a matter of opinion. So, Okay, so we're, we're rethinking not only the coinage, but also Islamic history here. Here's episode zero, as I like to call it. These are coins that have the, usually, the, the death date of the last Sasanian emperor, who was Yazdegerd III. He died in the 20th year of his reign, and most of these coins have that date. Um, many of them seem to be sort of fakey. Uh, in other words, also imitations rather than the real thing. These, these particular ones that you're looking at have one Arabic word in the margin between three o'clock and six o'clock, and it's jayad. This, will, this is to circulate, this is legal tender, this is valid. We don't find that on any other coins of the Arab Sasanian series. Uh, except for these ones that come from these first years. All of these coins of this period, I put aside, I think that they are almost all and perhaps all funny looking coins. So the first episode, in fact, is the coinage of a man named Abdullah ibn Amir, who was governor for Uthman. And the dates that are given there, 655, 56, are the putative dates for his coinage. That may be a mistake. I'll come back to it in a minute. 
Abdullah was the final conqueror, or at least he considered to have been the one who finished the conquest of the Sasanian Empire. He chased Yazdegerd III down. Yazdegerd was killed near the city of Marv by a local person, apparently, not by um, Abdullah, but he got the job done. That doesn't mean that all of Iran fell under the bureaucratic control of squads of Arab officials, but he finished off the empire, and that was in the year 651 of our calendar, or the year 31 of the Hijra calendar. And this is the first issue. I would just like to say I have not been able to actually modify my talk uh, to take account of this, but I am beginning to think that, in fact, this is the first issue, but it did not actually begin in 3536. I was just looking at coins with earlier dates. This date, this coin is dated in the year 35 of the Hijra, uh, but there are coins with earlier dates. Uh, 31, 32, 33, 34, and they seem to be concentrated in mints along the western uh, frontier of Iran, which are in fact close to the Arab centers of power, which were Kufa in central Iraq and Basra in southern Iraq. So it is possible in fact, and I need to look at it again, uh, the style of Bismillah, which is written here from the from three o'clock to six o'clock, is very much like the style of Bismillah on some of those earlier dates. And it may well be that, in fact, Abdullah's issue, because he was governor when these coins were struck, was being struck earlier. And it may also be that in, in attributing it all to him, well, I'm not sure of that either, because some of these mints may be in the northern part of the Eastern Caliphate, the Kufa section, which he did not control. So that would indicate if those, if those mints are also issuing coins that in fact the orders or the suggestion or the idea for this coinage came from the Caliph himself, Uthman. But at any rate, this is a discussion of, of how to date these coins. I want to skip over a lot of these things. I've tried to put in a lot of ideas that really I don't have time to talk about, but I also want this piece to be a reference um, for uh, reading later. Uthman was assassinated in the year 35 and things fell apart. Um, the next caliph was Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is the hero caliph of the Shiites today and for uh, 1400 years now, uh, he and his son ended up in Kufa, a new city that was founded in Iraq on the western um, shore, the western bank of the Euphrates with the desert behind it and Iraq and the Sasanian Empire in front of it until the Arabs conquered it. So he took over and moved to Kufa for the first time, the first caliph to rule from there and changed the coinage. The main change that he made was to change the era by which the coins were dated. For some reason, although his predecessor had used the Hindu calendar to date the coins, the date is on the reverse here at, uh, on, the, on the right side. Ali changes back to using the regnal years of Yazdegerd. Strange, but nevertheless true. And that's the only way they fit. This year 25 overlaps with the year 36 of the Hydra in the, of the previous coins. It's almost the same date. Uh, it does not look like my maps are coming through, but this was a map of Ali and Hassan. We have now issues not only from the south, but really certainly from all over the east. In other words, Ali and Kufa ruled the whole thing. And by the way, Muawiyah, on the other hand, his opponent who was in Damascus, did not have any mints and did not issue any coins. So here you see these two issues together. The earlier one 
to be dated to the government of Abdullah ibn Amir and Muawiyah. It's dated 36. And the other one comes from the same mint, but it's dated 25 and there's, therefore is slightly later than the first coin. You won't see much difference between them otherwise. And they were both issued in the same year of our present calendar. Uh, these are charts showing the issues. Uh, they are not quite up to date either. I learned things as I go along re-preparing this lecture and was not always able to bring my material up to date. In any case, that's what you have to do to find out what is happening is prepare charts and maps. And I don't have nearly enough maps, I'm sorry to say. So we can say, however, nevertheless, that Ali himself, even though his name is not on the coins, is the initiator of this issue. He kept issuing it for about six years, all over Iran, until the year 31 of the Hijra. And that's the end of the first, of the second episode. And now we come to the third one. Ali was assassinated, not by his enemy, the, the Umayyad Caliph, but by a Karaji. His son was Caliph for six months and then abdicated, leaving the Caliphate reunited once again. And guess who came back as governor of the East? Abdullah ibn Amir. But now there's something quite new. Blah, 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 what I just said. Here is Abdullah ibn Amir. Unfortunately, um, he, the inscriptions on these coins are not in, of course, any Roman script. They're not in Arabic script, except for Bismillah, which is very uninformative. They are in Aramaic script, writing the Persian language and transliterating Arabic names. So the first of these coins issued by Abdullah ibn Amir, he is the first Muslim to be named on coins. And there was some confusion at the beginning. The coin at the top of this triad of coins is, has only his name, Abdullah, which is in front of his nose. Uh, at, and that is in the first year of his, his uh, new rule. He goes back to the Hijra dating. This, the coins are dated 42. And then in the same year, but really it gets started in the next year, we have a fuller name. Uh, he uses not only his personal ism, his personal name, but also his father's lineage. He is Abdullah ibn Amir. And you see how it's translated, but the, uh, the problem or the curious point here is that that was at first that there was uncertainty about all of this. How do we do this new thing? Uh, we have his father's name above his name. So you read, if you read the name is now in two lines of script, Ibn Amir Abdullah. But finally they get it right. It, Abdullah Ibn Amir as written here. And that is the way the names are written on all the rest of the coins where they use a governor's name. Uh, in two lines in front of the face of the emperor. So whatever, these are questions. These are not questions I can answer, but um, they are the kinds of study that one can make by seeing where these coins were struck, which is all over the uh, Iran Shah, the, the plateau, not in Iraq. There are no coins at this time from Iraq. Um, and He set a precedent. Uh, I'm still actually back in Ali's corners, but I didn't want to be. I think that was out of order. Uh, we, we see uh, an Ishipur coin here. Uh, and again, we have this archaic Bismillah inscription, and I'm rethinking my position on the commencement of this first series. But let's move on. Uh, it seems that Abdullah in his older, his, his, his senior years was no longer able to control his domain very well. He was removed and brought back to, uh, went back to Arabia and the country was taken over by a young man named Ziad, a remarkable young man. He was not born a Muslim. He was not even born under Islam, 
he was born in a city up above Mecca. His mother was a slave named Sumaya. His father was a Roman slave. She was a Persian slave. So he was not even an Arab. But he did have the advantage that his owner, or rather his mother and father's owner, it's not clear what his status was when he was born, uh, perhaps also a slave though, uh, was a doctor. Well, there's nothing like having a doctor to see you through life as your father. And that certainly seems to have helped Ziad, who was a very intelligent and capable young man and made an impression everywhere he went. When he took over in the Hijri year of 47, he began to issue coins, but what name is he going to put on them? He's the son of slaves. He's not a noble Arab. He can't say he's Ibn somebody, it's just not done. And particularly if it's just uh, the, his father is simply uh, a, a slave, a, a, a Greek from the Byzantine Empire. So what does he do after his predecessor has put his name on the coins? He punts, I guess you could say. He goes back to using Khosrau, the name of the, I, I didn't mention this before, but they reverted to the name of the last great Sasanian emperor, Khosrau. Uh, and drop that of the last emperor, Yazdegerd. And he adds to it, although you can barely see it on the top coin, a third word in the inscription, Bismillah from three to six and Rabbi, my Lord. So in this way, he identifies his coinage, um, which I'm talking now about the top coin here, coin, which is anonymous, uh, without actually using his name. But then something strange happens. It was a big, big event in Muslim history. Um, two, three things happen in the year 50 Hijra, where we have these two coins both being dated in that year. One is the last of the early series and the first of the second series. First of all, his, a name suddenly appears on the coins. He is now suddenly Ziyad ibn Abi Sufyan. And who is Abu Sufyan? His, Putative father, the father of Muawiyah. The Caliph Muawiyah bought into publicly a story. I'm not sure anyone believed this story, but a story that his father had slept with Ziad's mother back in the day. And thus came Ziad. And therefore, Ziad becomes a brother of the Caliph. Now, nobody believed it, I said. I don't think even Ziad or, or, the, or the Caliph believed it. I don't believe it. But if the Caliph says you're his brother, you are his brother. So now he has a dignified name to put on the coins, and we have this um, new phase in his coinage. His coinage was very uniform. He was an excellent administrator. And here are 47 to 50. When it only has Khosrow's name, he's only meeting in the south because he's only governor of Basra, which is in the southern part of Iraq. And Basra and its territory, which move out here all across southern Iran. Oops. Ah, uh, yes, so then we get to uh, the year 50 and the new coins with his name on them are struck all over Iran. And he is now, we understand from the history, he's governor of both parts, the Kufa and the Basra zones of Iran. Uh, it looks like a deal has been done. He'll accept the appointment, uh, but only if he gets his recognition as a noble Arab rather than simply a slave boy. And he will uh, take on the burden of the East. And it is said and that Actually, the reason for doing all this was to make Ziad eligible to be caliph, but he died in 54 of the Hijra. We know that because it's the last date on his coins. The dates in the sources are variant. They're, the early Arab sources are not good on dates, however good they may be on narrative history, because the dates were not preserved. So we now have those dates from the coins from the numismatic evidence. When he died in 54, suddenly, here's the coinage of 54. Oh yes, so getting back to it, this was the situation 
while he was still alive, mints all over Iran, all the way out to Sijistan, Sakistan. And these are the Umayyad mints after his death. In fact, there are two towns in the same district and they mint coins in the name of the governor of Basra who succeeded uh, Ziad and then of the Caliph Muawiyah. Why that happened, we don't know. Why did all the mints close down? We don't know. Uh, we, we don't know why Muawiyah put his name there and nowhere else, but he is on the coins, verifies his existence, and he has the title Amir al -Muminin. So this is an excellent numismatic testimony for the legitimacy and the reality of the Arab Caliphate. Uh, there is the governor uh, in Basra. No other mints make, uh, issued coins for the Umayyads. These, these, these two, Umayyad was an Umayyad and Samara represented them. So what was special about Darabjird? Well, there are a lot of special things about it, but I still don't know why. We're gonna be running into one or two things and there are many more that I could cite. Then, but that's not all. There also were two other fellows who issued coins one of them in the year 54 and possibly earlier, and one of them in the year 56, and for a couple of years after that, off in a distant province. We don't know who these guys are. We don't know who they represented. They may have been rebels. We don't know. But one thing that is interesting here is that there are no coins of the Arab Sasanian series dated 55. Um, I'm hoping that there might be some uh, Iranians here with us today who could tell us, tell me why that might be. We have six coins, uh, but they're all official irregular strange issues. I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of them, but it will be in this presentation soon. We also have coins that are dated, that's the Hijra era, 55. We don't have any 55 Hijra coins. We don't have any 55 YE coins. Why? Because the number 55 was somehow unlucky. Um, I, I don't know. It's a, um, an interesting question uh, and a, mis a mystery. Now, Ziad had a son whose name was Abidallah. He did not directly succeed his father. There was this two year gap. He was sent off to Khorasan to practice to the far east of Iran. But he did well, he came back and he got his father's appointment and here is his coinage. Another, uh, he did several interesting new things. One of them was to close down all the mints in this district that we have seen in the picture of Ziad's minting and pull all the minting into Basra the first time the coinage was minted in Iraq by the Arabs. Actually, there was not nearly as much coinage as, as thought issued there under the Sasanians. Perhaps the two things are connected. So he closed all the mints down except Basra itself. And that is the coin of his first year. So he too, just like his father, was Quraysh, a noble Arab, and so on and so on and so on. Um, now, you may see in the, in the, in, the standard works on the subject, and particularly um, uh, Malik's uh, wonderful catalog, which came out just last year of the uh, uh, coinage, which is, however, constructed in the old way, mostly by, with alphabetical and chronological lists. And he lists a lot of mints for Abidallah. But the fact is, when you start looking at that list, most of them turn out to be errors or uh, not by Malik, just errors by previous scholar or strange things or imitations or funny looking coins. They are struck only for a year or two. They are very rare. And in, in fact, the only two mints were that, uh, were Basra, the capital of that zone and Darabjir. Again, that city, which is in Eastern Fars is special, but why, I don't know. I know no one knows. In his second half, in, uh, when uh, Muawiyah died and Yazid came to power, his son, Ubaidullah, was also made governor of Kufa. So now he again 
as his father had been promoted, he was promoted to ruler of all of Fars. And he began issuing coins in Northern Iraq as well as Southern. Uh, I like these because of their mint names. Tisfun, anybody want to guess what Tisfun is? Um, well, you can't actually because we've turned off the sound, um, but I'll leave it for a moment and see if you guess. And then there's Akola, which is said to be, and we, it seems to be a fact, another name for Kufa. It may be the Arab, uh, the non-Arab town that was there before the Arabs came, but we don't know. And I tried to look it up. It's the first time I've ever been totally frustrated by not finding something on Google. It ain't there, no matter how you spell it. But those were two of the mints, and there may have been others who were not quite sure where all those mints were. And they didn't succeed very well. Very possibly, here's teaspoon again, teaspoon. Um, anybody getting closer to a solution to the identity of the place? It is, in fact, teaspoon. We use the Greek name. Uh, which has a very archaic spelling, starting with a K or C, a hard C. Uh, but the name of the place was actually just Tispoon or Tispoon. Uh, they don't have an F in this alphabet, so they had to use P. So this is uh, the first and only example known to me that actually has that name on it. Now, I could be wrong, but I don't know that Tisiphon was ever put on a coin before this year. And that's the only year. It wasn't very successful. Um, that's the, the, his, his movement was not very successful. The other is Akala, as I said, which is supposedly the previous pre-Islamic name for the city of Kufa, but I'm not quite clear about what it was. Uh, the reason possibly that they didn't have much success and the reason the North Kufa, the Kufa zone was always uh, produced less coinage than the South, often didn't produce coinage at all for years at a time, is because there were no mines there. Whereas in the South, in Fars and uh, Kirman and uh, other places, there were fairly rich silver mines. Another one was Boost out near uh, Sijistan. Uh, and, and could have an abundant coinage. Also, I said this was the Ziyad. Ubaidullah was now the only son of Ziyad. His brother Sam was in Khorasan and ruled the cities. Khorasan is the northeastern frontier of Iran, and it simply the word means the east, uh, but it has always been a zone of its own in uh, throughout history. Oops. So Everything comes to an end. Yazid died. Uh, Ubaidullah was removed. All this happened in the year 64. But much earlier, the Caliph Umar, uh, Muawiyah designated his son as his successor before he himself died and had people swear allegiance to him and promise to obey him as Caliph. This had never happened before. Abdullah ibn Zubair, who was a prominent and very highly respected uh, elder of Medina and Mecca, refused to accept this. And in fact, those cities refused along with him. They had to be reconquered by Yazid. And it was extremely difficult because their feelings were strong and there was, there was, uh, there was plenty of strength behind the movement. Now, um, so it's worth running through this because for several reasons. First of all, he's often called a counter caliph or an anti caliph. He was not the counter caliph. Uh, he was as far as Yazid was concerned, but he didn't accept Yazid's uh, legitimacy and, and vice versa. Um, when Yazid died, that left Abdullah the only caliph in the room. And at that point, he should be considered a real caliph. Well, he was a real caliph. Uh, the Umayyads themselves did not maintain their line. It was six months later that finally a, a cousin of the family came forward uh, to claim, and he had to struggle uphill. 
He died after a year or so, and his son, Abdul Malik, the famous caliph, had to continue the struggle. Abdullah was caliph of everything. And this is why we need to call this Abdul, Abdullah ibn Zubair's caliphate and not simply a civil war of a rebel against legitimate Umayyad authority. What is on this screen here to, uh, sort of narrates all of that perhaps more precisely than I have. Um, now, there were lots of coins. In fact, another aspect of all of this is that uh, many Muslims, and not just in, the, in Arabia, also accepted uh, Abdullah and refused to recognize Yazid, and they started minting coins already during Yazid's lifetime. I didn't mention them, though, uh, talking about Ubaidullah, uh, but they, they were coins that were contemporary with Ubaidullah's coins issued in the name of Abdullah ibn Zubair by his partisans. So there is also a kind of a general disintegration of the uniformity that characterized the coinage up to this point. Uh, we have all sorts of local governors putting their names on coins, uh, mostly for, uh, uh, mostly loyal to Abdullah, but it's not quite clear in all the cases. Uh, there was also a rebel, a Harajite, who actually established a very strong kingdom in the middle of the Kirman province in the far southeast. Uh, there are also names that we can't even identify. So in other words, there was some, a period of some house. But in the end, the Marwanids, the, the second family of the Maya uh, dynasty, uh, were able to defeat the governor, uh, uh, Abdullah ibn Azabar's governor in Iraq and take over the East. <coughs> now they controlled all the mints and Abdullah didn't have any anymore and they issued the coins. And this is really when things sort of start getting interesting. Uh, I mentioned the two governors that were appointed. They were both relatives of the new, of the now Caliph of United Islam, Abdul Malik. Um, and the one that I want to talk about just to spare us uh, time, because things get very complicated now. And this is where I have some holes and loose ends. The, um, his, the, the Abdul Malik, you may remember, starting in this same, very same year, 72, 691 in our calendar, Abdul Malik began changes, particularly by instituting coinage for the first time at his capital, Damascus. Uh, I'm not showing these at all. These are not from I I Iran, and I'm limiting this. Uh, to Iran, but he had, he issued gold and silver and copper coins and had to solve the problem of what to put on these new coins. Meanwhile, his brother, Bishr, who was appointed governor of Kufa, had the same problem. And he had no mint tradition behind him. Remember that uh, Kufa tried to issue coins um, a decade earlier, more than a decade earlier, and didn't succeed very well. So for this reason, I suppose, I don't know what the reason actually is, the new coinage of Bisher, now back in Kufa again with the mint name Akola, was very, was variable. Uh, there are lots of different varieties of a little group of coins that sometimes don't have a proper date. They, some are dated 73, the year after the the reconquest of Iraq. Um, they don't have anybody's name on them. So this one has where the name should be in Arabic, Muhammad Rasulullah, where the governor's name should be. And they have a long inscription, which is called the Shahada, which is essentially the Muslim creed in um, a few words. Uh, there is no God, but God alone. Muhammad is the prophet of God. That is written around the edges, although you can only see traces of it on this specimen. This new creed was a very prominent element of Abdul Malik's um, presentation. 
He's, it's, all, it's on his coins, his new coins in Damascus. It's all over the, uh, the Dome of the Rock. We don't have evidence of it all being put together like this before this time. The, the words in it are all from the Quran, but they're different tags that were put together to form a creed. And that becomes very prominent in this era under Abdul Malik. So let's see what else I need to say about this. Nothing, really. Um, here's another one from that same group. It has a date. The date is now written where the name should be, and it is the year 73. Uh, the date should be on the reverse, and it only has a squiggle. And this has been misdated, misunderstood, these coins, and even attributed to earlier periods. But they all certainly belong together in that one year. Finally, they were replaced. Finally, it was only the, a question of uh, a year or maybe a little more. They were replaced by a new type, which had the name on the front, on the obverse in front of the face of the uh, emperor, as it should have, Bishr ibn Marwan, the, the caliph's brother and the governor of Kufa, and the long shahada written around it. But on the reverse, something totally, completely new. This is called the, the Caliph Oran series. They were issued for about four, let's see, three, four, and four, three years in Basra, and then in Kufa also when Bishr went there. You have a figure in the middle who is holding up his hands in prayer. He is pointing up to heaven, although it's not very clear here, but some of them have the fingers shown better. He has two attendants. Who are they? And it's been thought that it's the caliph. We don't know that, how. It could be anybody. It could be Bishop. It could be just a Muslim. And who are those two guys at the side? Well, the fire altar on the Sasanian types had two guys on each side. So the designer of this um, type uh, thought that the, the, these coins should also have two figures. The date and the mint are at the two uh, edges of the reverse, as they always were in the past. Although the date does seem to be 73, it's not quite sure. Okay, now we get to Al-Hajjaj. When Bishr died, he was replaced by Al-Hajjaj, who was the general sent to Mecca to deal finally with Abdullah ibn Zubair. He was a tough guy. He was an enforcer. He was very capable. He was an innovator. And you hear, see some of that innovation here on his coinage. I want you to look at the one on the left, the earlier coin of, with his name, which has this same shahada or creed written as a series of words arranged radially around the edge. Not a rare series of coins, but it certainly is desirable just because of that strange and, and, and uh, rather pleasant um, innovation. The other coin, apparently it, it, the radial design didn't work very well, so he reverts back to just the concentric Arabic uh, with the date and the mint. And these two coins come from, he, he closed down the mints in Iraq again. Okay, now we get to the rebellion of Ibn al-Ashad, and here's one of my gaps, because what replaced the two coins that, that you just saw were the reformed Islamic dirham with nothing but Arabic inscriptions. It was introduced in the year 79. And that should have been the end of all of the coins that I've been talking about, but there was a rebellion. And that rebellion brought around chaos in the East. Um, and it's so complicated, the coinage the result of uh, that uh, I wasn't able to put it all together. Um, the, in the area, you had still minting in some places of the new Arabic dirhams. You had in some places coins being entered, minted in the name of Al-Hajjaj, but probably not with his knowledge or approval. They were, they were his, uh, his um, followers, but not necessarily him. You have 
then coins of this Ibn al-Ashaf, who started out in the far east of the land in, in Sistan, north of India, and made his way back in rebellion. And his governors, he got as far as Iraq, he even conquered Basra itself, but then he was forced back, back, back again. And we can trace the whole rebellion thanks to the coinage. In fact, we've finally been able to date it thanks to a new find of, of coins that provide the dates we've been looking for exactly when he started and exactly when he died. Uh, this is a subject of an article I'm working on with a colleague and we'll come out with it as soon, let's hope. And I'm sorry to say, I don't have any images to show you of this. Then we come to the last issues, which are sort of ragtag, even after the rebellion, one of the things, though, that impresses me about this rebellion is their use exclusively of the old coinage, the Sasanian type, not the new coinage, the Arabic dirhams. Uh, and there are just a few late issues that also continue it out in the Far East. Um, and one of those is the very last coin that belongs to this main Arab Sasanian series. I love this coin. Because look at the guy on the reverse. This is no, there's no other coin like it. It's a small armored figure. I believe that the guy in the reverse is the same as the guy in the obverse. You can see that, that he has ribbons attached to the stem of his, his uh, crown, where the crown goes up into the... Uh, this is not the same crown you'll notice as the Sasanian one. This is a different crown. He has that same crown on his head on the other side. Who is this guy? Well, he names himself, he was Yazib ibn Halab, the son of a famous general of the East, whose coinage I skipped over for to sort of avoid confusion. But is it him or is this the Caliph himself put on the coin? We don't know that. Uh, we do have at, at this, almost this time in uh, Syria, issues showing the caliph in armor with a sword, this is something else. But at least it shows us what a well-to-do or, 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 or uh, 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 leading a, a, a soldier of the time wore, if you ever pictured the Arabs in, in galabeas and, and head, head scarves. In fact, uh, here's a guy who is ready for anything that might come up. He has his sword, he has his, his plate armor, and of course, he's got his coinage. So this is actually a good place to end. This is the last of this series, but it's also a good place to end. Now, I hope that at least no matter whatever the faults are of the paper, uh, I did not do this part. This is not really part of the mainstream, but the future construction, watch this site. Here's a, a word that comes to me very often when I'm trying to do history and numismatics. Only connect from Forster. Forster. It's a wonderful passage. It's a wonderful novel. And we fi I find so much in the field of numismatic a lack of connection. People don't connect the coins to history. They make up stories. Or they don't connect the elements of the history to each other and the elements of the coinage to each other because the coins are listed let's say alphabetically or by date without any regard to their actual relationships to one another. Only connect should be a motto for us. Uh, let the mint, first of all, let the mint be the focus for the study. Uh, my mint maps were deficient. They turned out to be harder than, to make than I thought. Uh, but we should identify the issues and put them in chronological order and take one period at a time, rather than simply taking every single mint alphabetically through its sequence, uh, which may be different from one area of the terrain that, uh, than another. Ignore the funny looking coins, FLCs. The usually uh, people come up with crazy ideas that might say, well, somebody might have been there in that year and might have minted coins. Well, yes, somebody might have been, but we don't know that. and we. We'll never get anywhere unless we ignore all that stuff, the underbrush, as I called it at the beginning. 
compare the mints to each other, compare what they're doing, compare the, know the geography, know the topography, know the administrative system. Make tables, charts, and maps to graphic, graphically illustrate the relationships of the coins. Real people doing real things, which is another one of my little, mot mot um, little mottos for history. Um, I to often, very often, imaginary people doing imagined things, or another term I have it for it is sealing evidence. That is C-E-I-L-I-N-G. You have a strange coin, you lean back, you look at the ceiling, and you think, now, how can one explain this coin uh, making up a story? There's certainly a lot of that in my field. I don't know about yours. And finally, also be able to read the text. Most of them were translated for this period that I'm talking about. And there's actually, one can get access even without necessarily being able to read the, the original languages. So that is it. It's time to exit this presentation. Uh, now, what do I do? I just uh, so I can I can actually I can end. Are you you? I think you ended your share screen. There were a number of questions in the chat, so I can either read those out or if you can see them, either either works just as well for me. Um, would you want me to, to read you through the? Either questions? works just as well for me. I want real questions, though. Thank you, Rudy, very much. I appreciate that, but. Um... I want, I, want, I want to be attacked. Michael um, or Rudy, is somebody emceeing or can we just ask our questions? You're also welcome to, um, to, to ask your question. You, you're all, you all should be able to unmute yourself. Um, only if there's like background noises will, will I mute you now. Um, it's completely- Well, what do, you want to, what, do, what do you want to do, Austin? Uh, you want to read the questions you ha already have before you start taking more questions? Sure, that's what we can, we can do that. That, that, that okay. seems, seems fair. Um, so the, the first question is, I, I'm going to butcher a number of these. Uh, I, yes, just I apologize. Have it. Just have it. Okay, so um, the first is, is kind of a note. It says, um, notice that it's not written as Abdullah um, Bamir, but rather translated into Persian as Abdullah Amiran using Middle Persian patronymic. No, the, uh, the, these are transliterations. Abdullah ibn Amir was his Arabic name. That's what has been written on the coin, but using the Persian Aramaic letters, Aramaic are. No, but Michael, sorry, because I made that comment, uh, but see, it is not written in Pahlavi in what you call Aramaic script as Abdullah ibn Amir, as you uh, yourself a transliterator over there. It is actually written Abdullah e Amiran. So it is well, not okay. So it's not translating it as uh, you know Joseph Smith is not, not writing it as Joseph yeah. Smith. It's translating yeah. it as Yusuf Ahangat. You know, like it's That's an translating point. the name. Yeah, so it, that's yeah, an excellent think, point, put it down. And, and Ubaidullah does the same thing as well. He does also write so, Ubaidullah is the time. So I think there's a significance to the way. fact that you translate the patronymic. Well, uh, you translate the joiner instead of saying Ibn, son of, it's just E, which as I understand it is simply a genitive indicator. But, no, but also Amiran, see it, it has, has the on at the end, which is the which is the patronymic suffix in Persian. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. actually completely translating the name. It's I'm, it's, I'm glad you I'm glad you said that because that's perfectly true and in fact uh, needs to be mentioned. Hey, do, do you want to go any further with the idea? No, no, no. That's that's what I, I was just basically further explaining my comment. That was all. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question here, um, it says, uh, I, is, this, is this the same, is this a follow-up comment from the same question? Let's see. I think, I, th I, th I think, no. Okay. The question I saw were, were there any copper or, 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 or gold coins? So that's, I was going to go, I was going to try to go in order um, from. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what came up on my No worries. Screen. No worries. Either way is just as if. Um, so the, the most recent question was, were there any copper or gold coins issued alongside these silver issues? Okay, easy question. 
Uh, yes, coppers are quite a lot. They are very hard to ca um, categorize. They come in all sorts of forms. There are some coppers who that, that have the same designs as the silver. There are some that have lions that, or a bull or an elephant or uh, nothing in particular at all. Um, and uh, mostly we can't read the mint names on them and mostly we can't read the dates on them if they even have dates. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, one single book. Uh, Rika, are you there? Rika Giselam has, um, has written a marvelous book and then revised it and uh, now she's working on the third revision of it. And we still don't have them organized into a, a, a kind of a pattern that we can start speaking about what followed what and, and what was contemporary. As for gold coins, none whatsoever. The Sasanian Empire itself had gold coins, but very few, uh, mostly for prestige reasons. And all of that must surely have to do with what they had in their soil. Uh, Iran has lots and lots of silver, or if, unless they've dug it all up by now. Uh, it, it, apparently, Iran does not have much in the way of gold mines. There was also a question about um, why uh, Zoroastrian imagery is still present in these coins. And you touched on this a little bit, but um, there was just kind of a question on if it was to ensure that the coins continued to circulate since not everyone was converted to Islam immediately. Yes, well, that's a good question, of course, and there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, you have to remember also that the Arabs themselves have been using these coins. There were no other silver coins in the Middle East. In fact, there aren't. There weren't during those centuries very much in the way of silver coinage anywhere. But the Romans had quite a lot, but mostly in Europe and not in the south, east. So the Arabs themselves thought, well, that's what a coin should have on it. Uh, they're, they're supposed to be. I don't even know if they. Now I'm sure not everybody understood what that image was. That there's a fire altar and there's uh, the. Um, emperor on either side of it guarding the fire altar. It's, it's actually three-dimensional, I believe, but we won't, we won't go there. So yeah, they thought that's what coins should look like. And so then along comes Abdul Malik, who was a revisionist, if you like, one of those progressives, one of those um, guys. And he said, why are we putting these things on our coins? But actually he himself copied the coins for a while and then looked for new types, new Arab types, and then said, no, no, wait, 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 wait. We don't want pictures at all. What we need is just the Quran. And so that's what they ended up with. Um, and the next question is, um, isn't, isn't this a, a, a Gazan, Gazgan surcharge over a coin of Yazid? Uh, I didn't understand what that word yeah, was. Yes, no, I'm so sorry about my pronunciation. These, have, these coins do have stamps on them uh, put on later by other principalities. That's, I, I think that's what the question was. It, it's okay, sorry, that was another comment from me. It's okay, uh, it doesn't matter. It's something we can discuss later. But there was also a question if um, if we could see you, if you were able to share your video. I'm not sure if, if, if you how have. Do I have to do, how do, what do I have to do for that? Um, at the bottom of the screen, the same place that we saw with the share screen, there are yeah. two buttons I over this. Says, on, there I am. Stop video. There, there you are. Excellent. We can see you now. I have to print my mustache. <laughs> um, Let's see, there's, um, there was, there's, a, there's a question from Vivek that was next, and it was just kind of a, a placeholder. So, Hi, um, Hi Michael, nice to see you. Hello, um, Vivek. Yeah. Lovely, lovely to see your paper. I wanted to um, ask you if you had any ideas about that dagger that, um, that one of the obverse coin figures is holding in his, in, in, in sort of his belt. And I was very interested in it because it reminded me of Umayyad things, but do you have any ideas at all about this? Um, I, I don't know whether you have it in your mind, the image of this. You mean at the very end, uh, the yeah. fellow armor had a yeah, sword. Yes, and, and just the way that that, that that dagger was being held. 
and and it looks it, it remind not necessarily an Umayyad thing, but it reminds me of things that are Umayyad. Um, and so I wonder whether you have any ideas about that. In your in, also in your sort of plea for us to connect things. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't know exactly how to answer that. It's a sword and it's hanging there on his belt. That's all I can say. Um, we could get into it. Um, but I'm sure, I assume that it was part of the standard equipment of an armored soldier. I mean, of a, it's a particularly. Um, okay, and, um, and then Stuart said that he had some comments or questions. Yep, thank you. Uh, good sure. to see everybody here. Mike, I want to thank you for your talk. Um, I just want to, uh, you talk about connections. I want to connect your talk to work I did in my dissertation. I had a chapter on the use of dates and calendars that basically supports what you did. Uh, that dissertation was completed in 1997. There is a copy in the ANS, and I have a, a, a copy that I'm going to make a PDF for that, that I would happily circulate uh, to let people uh, uh, see it. Uh, sometimes what happens is we keep redisco rediscovering the same thing um, and it's helpful to, to see how other people have treated a, a similar problem. Um, I just wanna make one quick comment about, you mentioned Al-Hakam bin Abi al-As, as though he's a person that we don't know very much about. And um, this is taken on a, an aspect of an urban legend. We actually know lots about Al-Hakam bin Abi al-As and um, he's mentioned in sources all over the place, but in general, numismatists don't consult these sources, so they don't really know about him. He is the, he's from Ta'if. He's the brother of Dahman bin Abi al-As, a very, very important companion. Uh, he's the brother-in-law of uh, uh, Maryam bint uh, Abu Lahab uh, from Quraysh. So he has connections to the, uh, to the uh, uh, Hashemites. Um, he participated in the, in the, the first conquest of, of Fars, of, of Bahrain and Fars, with his brother Dahman. Uh, he also went with his brother and was in the first conquest of El Hind. Um, in the early 50s, he had property in Al Basra. He was uh, appointed to Khorasan, but there was a mix up, supposedly, uh, by his chamberlain and a different. Uh, El Hakam bin Abilas was 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 sent to Khorasan, and and in that background, then he he then became governor in in, in Kerman. Uh, there, he was a staunch supporter of of the Umayyads. He was a personal acquaintance of Ziad bin Abi Sufyan. Um, in 2003, I published an article on him, uh, talking about the legend that he has. La Hakam El I'm sorry, Bismillah, Rab Al Hakam. Um, or Rebel Holcomb, uh, depending on how you want to read it. Um, and, and that legend really is a retort to the Harajites. I, I think a lot of people, they see the word El Hakam or El Holcomb, and they say, oh, well, the Harajites have a similar word in their, in their legend. But if you think about what is actually being said, uh, he's saying the same thing that, that Ziad bin Nabi Sufyan, Ziad bin Nabi Sufyan says when he says, Bismillah Rabbi. He, he, he places the ruler in an intermediary, intermediary position between God and the community. And this is very much uh, a, a, an ideological component of, of Umayyad legitimacy. And it was it, antithetical to the Harajites who, who uh, opposed raising uh, any ruler above uh, the level of the community. So I just wanna share those points, thank you. I, th I thank you very much. I, I um, am pretty familiar with all of that. Uh, the, uh, actually, I was perhaps influenced too much in my presentation by uh, Malik's book, where he sort of leaves it open as there are two different um, uh, al Hakims, at least, if not more. Uh, no, the, uh, it, it, oh, well, I, I know we don't need to argue about it. Uh, we can't do too much. Um, he, I, he, it could be him. It could be uh, him. Dale Bishop, Dale Bishop, uh, and Heinz Galway both identified him back in the seventies, and they identified the same person. Uh, sometimes the grandfather's name is not included, but the, they identified the same person. Uh, for well, I, I I could probably convince myself that you're right. I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I I left it suspended because uh, uh, because also Malik had done that.
And I think there is some pushback about it. So we could discuss that uh, more fruitfully on the phone, for example. Or you can come, come sleep over now. I've got a, a spare bed. Sure, as soon as I get vaccinated. OK. <laughs> Uh, the next question we had here was from, from Rudy. Do you want to share that? Um, I just wanted to ask my usual question, which is, um, Rudy, how are there any, are there any, are there any uh, significant differences in silver content from different mint sore over the period that you're discussing? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, uh, the, the word significant, of course, is important. Uh, they, they, they were mostly in the middle 90s. Um, we don't, we don't, well, we have actually a lot of data that was uh, uh, produced by uh, uh, Adon Gordas, and he continued doing this, uh, not publishing. He pu published quite a lot at first, and I think it's very important in studying these coins. Uh, I always look forward at the gold content. You ask about the gold. Well, there was actually gold in these coins. In fact, you always find gold uh, in uh, with silver in nature to some extent. And the percentages uh, vary from place to place depending on where the silver comes from. So that you had a high percentage, which was like almost 1% up in the Northeast and a far lower percentage down in the Southwest. Uh, as far as the... The variations in the silver content, I think that they were close enough. And remember, the coins are quite small in value. They're not that great. I know, I know for a working man, it would be a lot of money, but money changers chose to ignore them. So I don't believe there were any significant differences. I don't, I've never seen any kind of consistent differences in the actual percentage of silver. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Dr. Lerner, I think your question was, was next. If you want to go ahead and share. Oh, I have all, thank you, Michael. You've um, made this very much clearer than it had been to this uh, non-specialist. But I'm curious about the last coin that is um, Yaz, what is his name? Yazu, um, th those three uh, dots, in a triangular formation. Now he wears it as part of his jewelry, but it's also on the rim of the coin. Do you have any thoughts about that and its significance? I don't think it's in any of the earlier coins, but we have it all over Sasanian imagery. No, I've been wondering about that for years. On these coins, uh, the most common uh, neck ornament is the what I started calling the triad because it's a nice short word. Right. But they're not all like that. Some of them have a circle. Some of them have a, 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 a quadrilateral or four points. Uh, I and I believe that the three dots come from Kosrau and his coinage. I've never actually. Now that you make make me stop and think about it, I'm not sure I can swear to that. Um, so I don't know what to call them. Now, the three dots in the margin, for example, uh, first appear under Ziad when he was governor, just a part of, of one of the provinces as a young man, uh, not at the beginning of his government, but at the end of it. They are significant of Darabjir, another special thing. They don't have those dots much of anywhere else. But then they do start popping up much, much later on different places. So again, why are they there? I couldn't tell you. Uh, maybe that mint felt that it had to identify its coins by something that was less uh, 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 dense to, to interpret than, uh, than uh, Pahlavi or, but it certainly is beyond me. I was hoping that you would know you're the art historian and this is a graphic, uh, well, that's why I'm asking the question. <laughs> um, I've wondered about it um, in Sasanian art. It is a very common um, uh, 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 garment motif 
and um, and we find it on the on the torque some of the necklaces of the Sasanian kings, um, and I suspect it has some kind of astrological uh, meaning, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know. And but it's something that I've always been interested in, and to see it both in the margin of this that last coin as well as as part mm -hmm. of his necklace, which not every coin is shows, yeah, um, is significant. Also, you have, um, people have given it all sorts of names, Patif, whatever, but uh, you will often have on textiles in particular, yes. um, a bird holding a ribbon that ends in either a single drop or a triple drop. Yeah. And so it has some meaning yeah. and yeah, I've been I collecting so. things, but I do. Fairly, for me, modern times from the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, no, from the Ottoman Empire, fabrics with these th same three large dots. All well, that's, that's often called the Chantamani, the, you know, which goes back to well, Buddhist imagery. Called, there's still the three dots. So I don't know. And I'm, I'm just amazed that nobody has ever actually studied this and written a big fat book or two or three volumes on well, the project. Well, I suspect people have mentioned it, but no one's put it all together. But sometimes the three dots are shaped in a triangular, upright triangular way, and sometimes it's reversed. Mm -hmm. And those are decisions that are made. It isn't just done haphazardly. So I was just wondering. Um, so Crib is making a comment here about them, did yeah. you? Um, there's, there's, um, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember, I think it's Chagatai coins have three dots on. Yes, I and think. The Ooh, three I dots think. there, I think, signify a meeting of three heavenly bodies. Well, which heavenly bodies, Joe? I mean, that's... Well, it's, you know, it, it's, a, it, it's a meeting of you know, Jupiter, Mars, and the moon, or something like that. Well, yeah. Oh, I, 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 I wouldn't be a bit surprised if it's not in some way astronomical or astrological, but I don't. Yes, I'm, I have no doubt it, it is, but how, how do we really identify it? And then what is the significance of them being upper uh, triangular this way or reversed? And I, again, this is done deliberately. So somebody has an idea in mind and is trying to express something that can be readily, um, easily read by the people looking at the object. Yeah. So it's known. I just throw this out. There is one thing. There is one thing to to remember in this. I think, and that is that this is not just because it's on coins that were issued by Arabs. It's not necessarily becoming an Arab symbol or even a symbol that the masters, that is the the um, rulers. Uh, understood. It was there. They'd copied it. Well, not only did they copy it. It has any significance for the Arabs. It, well, that's my point. It had significance to the people who were using the coins and maybe yeah. helped give the coins legitimacy to those non-Arab peoples. But it, no, it had had. meaning. But I, I, that's probably much less important than and I, 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 much, uh, much less important in general, this whole idea that they the people had to be pleased by the coins. Well, you know, if they don't like those coins, what are they going to do instead? Uh, well, we'll talk about that further, but I don't <laughs> I agree with you. Um, okay. Sorry, might I, might I add something here that these dots actually appear on non-Arab uh, Sasanian coinage as well. And that, for example, I, I can recall that on the coin of Spurmartan Shah, which is basically copy of the uh, frontal coins of Khosrow the second, they also appear on the margins on a double margin, actually, double dotted margin. So um, I think the fact that that coin was um, minted in Ambir, the capital of Gozgan, might have something yes. to do with this. It might be a local coinage and uh, might have something to do with the dots on the margins of the Heftalite coins. Yes. Well, they all might, of course. And I believe there are, are the, I believe that, the, the, by the way, they're also very uh, common on uh, Abbasid dirhams. Um, relatively common. I mean, not, not on the majority of them, but they do certainly appear quite often. 
and uh, on coins throughout the ages. So I don't know. Marginal dots appear in ones, twos, and threes. Oh, look what we've got. Coins. Hmm? I say marginal dots appear in ones, twos, and threes on Sasanian coins. Uh, and it's only when you get to three that they form a triangle naturally. Yes. Um, if you look back all the way to Hormuz the Southern, to the eagle on the front, he's holding either one pearl, two, or even three, and the three is in a triangle. Yes, but how are they arranged? Um, I can show you if I can share the screen. Uh, yes, here we go. Share. Right here. May I speak, please, Michael? Thank you. I just wanted um, to ask you to speak, actually. Okay. So I'm going to. Um, you notice that it's really hanging from the bird's beak. It is. And that's my point. It's a very specific symbol. And I don't, I don't know what it is. I suspect it's astral in some way. On other coins, though, when you have one or two, these dots will have little tails on them as if they were pomegranates. See if I can find you one. This is hard. And notice, notice the three dots on his um, hair covering. Oh yes, it's fabric. full of them. So it's it's a fabric. It's a design that we find on fabric. We find it on Sasanian silver. People wearing, particularly women, wearing clothing that has this these three dots. Well, I don't we'll ever know right now. Maybe suit of ours, but I can't remember it. So, so maybe there are more different questions, because frankly, um, I've been wondering about this for fifty years now, and so have a lot of other people, and nobody <laughs> seems to know. Actually, Bob, Bob, your question was was next um, about the reading of the uh, Anbir coin. Uh, I know that not too much of a problem that I've gotten. Michael on this a couple of other times. He won't like it. But you might as well. On your last coin, the Anbir coin, you know, I think you've got date 85 on there. Uh, Can I speak? I, I've been working on the Anbir coins. Um, and yes. you're right, they say 84. It is. It's the ball. Um, and as well as countermark by Julad, they also have the name of Julad in the in the margin. Um, the 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 ruler of uh, Juzhan. It's a it's a very strange coin. We know a lot more about those coins thanks to you, Joe. And and um, I think they're becoming more integrated into the wider Iranian here mm. too. Um, I, but, I have a talk yeah, which no, the, nothing to brag about. I mean, nothing. That, I don't know of anything. The, 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 apparently, the Anbir and its uh, district and the kings uh, had a resurgence of power in that period. Yeah. Is I, it, I, I've given a they, I've they, they, they made a online. crime for a while. Yeah. I, I've put a talk online. Um, uh, via the Ancient India and Iran Trust. I gave a talk to them on these coins um, a few weeks ago, and it's now available on YouTube. So if you um, search for the Ancient India and Iran Trust, okay. you'll, you'll, you'll see the talk. Is the swapping of mint and date consistent through the whole issue? It's... Um, uh, I'm sorry. It, sorry, it appears... Um, in, in this, um, because some of the coins have two mint names on them. And so mm -hmm. when, they, when they take the other one away, they put the date there instead of where it was before. Anyway, look at the talk and you'll see. 
Can you put a link in the chat? Aha. Uh -huh. It is. Now, will I be able to get this later on? Because I don't know. You'll yes, we can also it. put it. We I'll can find it, it anyway. I'll find it. I'll find it. We can add it to the um, this when we put this on YouTube as well. We can include that in the um, the links in the description. Okay, let me bookmark that. Okay, and um and uh, Bob Hogue, I think, had a question or a comment. If you're you're still around, um, I've put the link in the in the chat. Great, just Thank the you. observation that the three dogs then. And, and Bob Hogue, did you was there a question or a comment that you had as well? Uh, well, just my observation that the uh, three dots are there routinely on the Tabaristan coins. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't hear the comment. <clears throat> the three dots appear routinely on the Tabaristan. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. They're all over the Tabaristan coins. I was thinking that too. I heard you say it before, anyway. Yeah, but it's true. So, go figure. Okay, does anyone else have any other questions? Those are all the questions that were in the chat, but feel free to unmute yourself um, and, and ask directly. Um, can I ask a, a question? How soon do you think the Arab Sasanian coinage stopped functioning in Iran? Well, that's very hard to say. Uh, it depends on what we mean by function. Uh, it does seem that uh, you see, we find these mixed hordes quite often, even into the ninth century. Uh, I have a theory that these uh, was apparently don't, don't actually show that coins from the uh, sixth century through the seventh and eighth and ninth were all circulating together in the marketplaces, but that they're, these are old coin hordes. Uh, I, I, I suspect you've heard the argument that when a new coinage comes in and it's accepted by the money changers and the government and so on and so on, that coinage has a good surplus value because you know that you can go off and spend it easily. But all of those other coins are full of silver and they can't get, they can't be worth any less than they are now, unlike the present coinage, which could be repudiated. So instead of melting them all down, why not just put them away in your treasure chest? They, 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 they form capital. Uh, you might be able to flog them off on some outlanders who won't know the difference. I don't know. So, so I would say that the hordes that we find of Umayyad dirhams have nothing in it but Umayyad dirhams usually. I mean, they don't mix coins. There, there may be exceptions to anything, but uh, uh, that the that the the coins that seem to be, and certainly we have evidence of hoards buried in the ninth century that are contained Sasanian and Arab Sasanian coins. I mean, you've probably seen them too. So, what are we to make of that? I don't think that all those coins were coins were circulating promiscuously together. I think that those would have been forming the stock, especially if you were going to bury something as a kind of reserve to hide it away. That's a good thing to bury the old silver, which is worth what it's worth. Nobody can devalue it. It's already been devalued. So that's that's my only. I think that that the uh, that the uh, in in everyday commerce, I think that probably the Sasanian and Sasanian type coins disappeared. But there's always exceptions to everything. I mean, you could say that would be true of Bishop or it could be true of, of Tisphon, it could be true of Baghdad and not be true of someplace out on the steppe somewhere where the horsemen are riding. Are you looking so skeptical? You, you make me keep talking and I should, I should let you come back. <laughs> what do you think? on that, that point. Yeah, okay. Uh, could I just add something here? I mean, uh, Joe, you of course know we have these imitations out on the Eastern frontier that, that are being struck until the end of the eighth century in, in Sijistan and then the Bukhar yes. Huda. The, yes. The yes. Now those are kind of a local coinage, but I don't know if they're- The wild frontier. Hmm. Um, 
So I think that would be an, an example of, for example, could you mix Tamaristan dirhams in with Sijistan in, uh, or boost coins? I don't know. They're half weight. Well, you, you Here's a question. Why would you consider a Sakistan Yazgard 3 with a frozen year of 20, but with Bismillah, not an Arab Sasanian coin? Um, actually, the ones with the date 20 mostly do not have the Bismillah. They have other things, but there are some. I just don't know. That would mean that in the very year when Yazdegerd was killed, they started minting coins with the Arab inscription. Um, they just don't know. They kept minting 20 for years, as far as we can tell. Do what? 20 was a frozen date. Well, it that's easy to say. Era. Well, it's easy to say, but then where did the Arab part come in? That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. If a coin has a frozen date on it, unless it's Darabjerd, it's probably... Um, not a, a valid official government coin, but it could well be a a uh, sort of a local circulation imitation. It could be anything. And so just end, Mike, they had big issue of year 20, right? What? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. In Sijistan, you're, you're, you're not talking about the, the Sijistan year 20 date as being not official, are you? I'm talking about being frozen and right. issuing through the post-Yazgard era coin stuck to 20. Well, it's a, it's all, I, you know, it almost always has to be a matter of guesswork. Trying to answer a question like that. How can we know? Well, what do you got? Hold it up higher. Well, that's a Yazgard. Just holding it. That's a Sijistan Year 20. Well, that's Bob Hogue. Yeah. And is that SK? It certainly looks like Sakistan style. Yes. You can call it style. Yes. Does it have anything marginal on it? Bismillah. Oh, there's this, yeah, that's SK. Yeah, I like doing this fine work. It's, it's hard to see that, Bob. Could you? Oh, it does. It does. What is does that? What? Gaid? So far, I haven't seen the damn thing. It looks It looks pretty official, too. Why? What looks official? Is it the good... Because yeah, it's very good this is an official like coin, and you better believe it? I believe it. Well, of course. You have faith. <laughs> yeah, you have a yeah. nice ceiling there. Staring at it. You like that? So it's got giant on it. You know, one of the things about that, there are two, actually, two different uh, series with the word giant on it and written in two different ways. And I don't believe they could have come from the same workshop at the same time or the same people. That's one of the reasons why I, I, I think those coins are likely to be. And the other thing, there is, a, there is a numismatic rule that might help us out here. If a coin tells you how good it is, don't trust it. Anytime you have a label on a coin that says, this is okay, it may not be. But the frozen year Sakistans stylistically look very much like the late teen Sakistans. What would prompt them to start copying the coins of Yazdegerd? Do we have any Sakistan coins of Yazdegerd himself? I think we do actually, don't we? Absolutely, that's the most numerous. Well, I, I, there's another thing about all of this. If you want to make coins privately, one of the best things to do is not to make copies of the circulating legal coinage of the king or the governor. Make copies of old coins, make copies of foreign coins, as long as people are willing to accept them. 
Um, and I think that making copies of old coins of Yazdegir the third would be appealing 50 years later, 100 years later. The, 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 what you have out there evidently is a huge mine operating in Boost or in, in this region for look like it would be a century. Um, I don't know when those, those imitations come to an end. Um, and you, the one thing you don't want people to do is to look at it and say, well, this is a fake. Yeah, too close a comparison. If you pick an old coin, they'll say, well, look, it's just another beat up old coin. And, you know, who knows what's going to be on those. What, why does your head keep rippling against her skirt? Uh, <laughs> Never mind. That, <laughs> and, and there was another question that someone put in the chat. Um, uh, is it known why Tiberistan continued minting the old type for such a long time afterwards? Because they were cool. Well, look at the Maria Teresa dollar, for example. There's another example of a frozen date, a frozen coinage, a frozen type. Uh, I think such things do exist. They're not it's, it's exactly freaky. To look at the, the Merovingian coinage, which all tries to look like it's an imperial coinage coming from the uh, Caesar Augustus himself, and so on and so on and so on. Prestigious coins are imitated, and old prestigious coins are especially good to imitate. So, but the Debaristan is better. Or intellectualize the whole thing and try to come up with really nifty ideas of why these people did these things when in fact they were just saying, get on with it. Oh, well, I put Bismillah on them. That'll do it. We, I think we do tend to over, over value the, uh, the uh, manipulative value of these things. It's just, it's just money. It's like, when did you ever look at a dollar bill to see what it really has on it or how many people have? Mike, would you be willing to say, yes? Would you be willing to say something about the metrology of these coins? That is to say, how easily they circulated against each other in the marketplace, or do you have a sense that some of them circulated only regionally, whatever regionally means? Yes. Well, um, if they did, I think it was more by type. Uh, and they would have to be, it would have to be a very distinctive um, feature to make people say, oh, that's not one of ours. I can't take that one. Um, the, the metrology of them seems to be the same. By the way, uh, they, in a way, almost perpetuate the Athenian dram, although the Athenian dram itself perpetuates the old Middle Eastern unit. Um, they actually, the original Sasanian weight standard was about 4.25 plus or minus. Uh, and that's, these coins have declined in weight. A lot of that happened in the late Sasanian period, not by the Arabs, but they're still just over four grams or so. But they're not, you would have to weigh coins like this in any quantity. On the other hand, I calculated the value, Bob, I never got back to me on my, on my uh, US dram. Um, that uh, the, the value of the uh, Muslim dirham was 12 cents in US silver. Uh, the full weight Sasanian dram would have been 19 cents. So 19 cents might have been a lot of money to a peasant or an urban workman or somebody like that. But as far as the money changers were concerned, it just wasn't worth trimming it. You just either take the coin as it is. And if you've got a million, if you want to do a large a transaction, you weigh them to make sure that the total weight, I mean, is up to what it should be. And then you don't worry about how many coins are in there. Otherwise they'll steal you blind because people had lots of time to sit around. They had slaves to do the work um, and, and sort out all the light coins and try to pass those off to you and keep the heavy coins for themselves. But I don't think they did that. So I don't think there was enough difference in any of these coins to make them, um, uh, 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 to make their, their, their weight uh, important in, the, in terms of the value of the coin. 
But I don't know, Bob, the Hogue is looking interested. Or else his camera is, I know. <laughs> he's, he's, he's not trying to stare me down. His camera just froze up. <laughs> no, in terms of weight of silver, I think maybe a little bit more than that, but similar the purchasing. Well, power let's say the, uh, the Tabar stuff. You know, if you look at Baladri's introduction to his passage on coins, he said there were coins among the uh, people of Iran before the Arabs came in, in, in the early years, such that 10 mythkals, 10 coins weighed 10 mythkals. Notice he does it as a group number. It's not something he invented. He's copying what he's been told by the experts. 10 co coins weighed 10 mythkals. There were others in which 10 coins weighed eight mythkals. There were those in which 10 coins weighed six mythkals. And there are 10 such that 10 weighed five mythkals and so forth. So in other words, they had, in fact, their weight standards were calculated. Uh, we can identify many of those coins. The, the Tabaristan coins were the weight of five. They only weighed half the weight of the full weight coins. But the Iranian way of saying that was, 10 of these Tabaristan coins weigh five mythkals, whereas 10 of our ancient traditional coins weigh 10 mythkals. Now, mythkal is, of course, the Arab word. The Persians had a different word for it, but that's a, a good translation of it. Um, so it's, it's clear that there were different weight standards at different parts of the country. Some, some parts, Azerbaijan supposedly used weight of eight. Uh, we've never, I've never seen a weight of eight coin. On the other hand, if you actually do a frequency graph of the weights of these pieces, you do find that they peak up at five, at six, at seven. Who knows how much of that is because they've been cut down to a local standard and who knows how much is the original weight of it. Now, as long as those coins are all considered to be of the same metal fineness, the same metal contact, you can just throw them all into a pot and you weigh them locally. So you could, if the Tabaristan coins are considered to have the same metal value, grain for grain or whatever, then you could mix them as, as the as the large coins. You can mix them together and just weigh the whole thing. If you're in Azerbaijan, you weigh them out with weights that have an eight mythical standard for the weight of the coin. If you're weighing it somewhere else, it would be ten. If you're weighing it in Tabaristan, it would be five. You have different weights. So that the same coins can serve as different units of money. And of course, prices are going to vary in proportion to whatever um, standard they use to weigh their coins. Excellent. Okay. Well, I think that, that was the, the last question that we had um, listed. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for, for the talk. Um, and we will post this on our YouTube channel shortly. Um, in the next couple of weeks, there, there was kind of a backlog, but we'll get those um, all the, the videos from the Money Talks up shortly. Um, also, if you enjoyed this talk, you are um, absolutely welcome to donate to the ANS. Um, or, of course, you can... <laughs> Join well, wait, where's our coffee and, and wine reception? The, the what happened to the coffee and wine reception? The, the coffee and wine reception is um, at, at, um, at, at, your leisure, <laughs> at your leisure in your homes. Um, right. It's dribbling out of your A drive. <laughs> it's all, um, all, virtual, all virtual at present. Um, and of course, you're also welcome to join us for our annual gala, which we'll be having in January. You should have all received an email um, this past week inviting you to the gala, and you can um, check check out that um, invitation for um, how to to join. It's free to join, um, but if you want to be entered into the raffle um, or to receive uh, our limited edition uh, gala pin designed by one of our Saltus Award winners, um, you can um, purchase uh, raffle tickets and and get. Um, the information all from your email. So thank you for joining us and we hope to see you soon. You can join us for our money talks um, starting back in 2021. Uh, this is the last for the year and we'll be having our final long table discussion um, on this Friday with Dr. Lucia Carbone on the numismatic collection at Columbia University. So thank you. Thank you all for coming and listening to me.
Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Good seeing you and good hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming along. Thank you. We should do this every week. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, indeed, indeed. It would be nice.